Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's installment of our virtual sequencing seminar series. I'm Ken Shopman. I'm the executive director for ABRF. We're pleased to be presenting this series in conjunction with our corporate partners. Today's presenting organization is Oxford Nanopore Technologies. Uh, I'm also joined by Anoja Pereira, one of our leaders in ABRF who has put this series together. Before we get started with our colleagues from Oxford, I just wanted to share a couple of points um, around some upcoming events for ABRF. First of all, before we get to that, if you have questions, um, please use the chat function. Also use that to introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining from and what institution you're with. A reminder that today's session will be recorded. You heard the announcement a second ago. Everyone will receive a link to the recording tomorrow. Uh, and it'll also be posted on the workshop page on the ABRF website if you'd like to share it with colleagues who weren't able to join us today. In addition to our series, we have other upcoming events in person. Um, the series will continue on a weekly basis. We'll have next week, we take a week off on the 13th for some of the other local events uh, in ABRF, and then two more programs, the 20th and 27th. You can register for any and all of the programs at the link you see on the screen through the ABRF website. Each program is the same day and time, Thursdays, 2 p.m. Eastern. The ABRF chapters round out their annual calendar of events here in October. October 12th to 14th, our Neural Skid or Northeastern chapter will be meeting in Rochester, New York. There's still registration opportunities available, also travel awards. You can find that here if you scan the QR code on this page or again, go to the ABRF website. And then our Midwest chapter rounds out the calendar October 17 and 18 in Columbus, Ohio, adjacent to the campus of Ohio State University. Um, once again, you can see their program details and more information and registration and details at their website as well. And then finally, just mark your calendars for what will be a terrific event, the ABRF 2023 annual meeting. We're pleased to be uh, hosting a meeting in Boston next year, May 7 to 10. So we're hoping for terrific weather uh, in spring in Boston. Registration for the annual meeting will open by the end of October. Sponsorship opportunities are already available. Um, we've had terrific support from sponsors even at this early stage. So with that, I will stop sharing those slides and welcome James Breyer with Oxford Nanopore to present today. Thank you very much. Ken, thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will just do a quick plug out for the folks in Rochester um, who are uh, hosting the uh, ABRF meeting, the Midwest. Um, my daughter is a student at uh, Rochester, so I unfortunately won't be able to make it, but um, I did tell her that there was a chance that I might be able to be there. So good luck. I hope that meeting goes well for you. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm joined by one of my colleagues, Catherine Melville. She's the regional sequencing specialist. Um, we brought her along because she's going to be my technical backup. If there's questions that uh, are posed, um, she'll be able to, to uh, help me out if there's any questions that I can't answer. Um, but I'd like to um, say thank you again for having us. Um, I am the director of segment marketing at the Life Science Research Tools. And we've put together a short uh, presentation, give you a quick update um, on some of the things that are going on at Oxford Nanopore and talk a little bit about some of the research and uh, applications that people are using um, with our platform. So let's see if I can advance my slides. It's not like I've been doing virtual meetings for the last two years. Um, so I'm guessing that many of you are already familiar with Oxford Nanopore and our ability to do sequencing um, using a, a protein called a nanopore. Um, I wanted to use this slide as sort of an introduction to our technology. Um, I won't go into too much detail of how it works, um, but I will go into enough detail for those of you who've never of our platform will be able to walk away understanding how we do sequencing differently from other platforms. In Oxford Nanopore, we use a protein that you can see here in blue that's embedded into a synthetic polymer membrane, and that protein is called a nanopore. And it creates a small opening or orifice in that membrane to allow us to be able to thread individual molecules of DNA or RNA through that opening and be able to then read the DNA and RNA molecule bases um, as they pass through that um, nanopore. The pink molecule that you see on top of the nanopore is called a motor protein or a motor enzyme. And it helps us to do a couple of things. It helps us to one, uh, open up a double-stranded DNA molecule from uh, double-stranded to single-stranded. It also serves to break any secondary or tertiary structure that are found within the molecules that we're sequencing. 
and it helps us to regulate the speed for which the DNA or RNA molecule is passing through the nanopore. Now, I've said in my uh, 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 slide here, as I've described it, I've used the word DNA and RNA. And when I talk about RNA, I'm not talking about RNA that we've converted into cDNA. Um, our platform has the capability to sequence both native DNA molecules and native RNA molecules. And this allows us to do direct sequencing of those molecules. And because we're not doing any PCR or amplification bias, we're able to detect modified bases um, in our platform without having to do any sort of bisulfite or upfront conversion of those modified bases to be able to detect them. In other words, we're able to sequence both canonical and non-canonical bases and be able to read them individually as they pass through the nanopore. And the way we're able to do that is that we are essentially creating an electrical current. We basically apply an electric potential to our system and it helps us to drive those DNA and RNA molecules through the nanopore from the top side of the membrane to the bottom side. And as we apply that electric potential, we're causing the motivation of ions to be able to move through the nanopore. And when there's nothing in the nanopore, it creates what we call an open current state. And we can measure that in real time. But as the DNA or RNA molecules pass through, each of the individual bases create distinct disruptions in the signal, the ions that are flowing through, which we can read and interpret with our algorithms to allow us to be able to interpret the different complexities of the DNA and RNA molecules that we're sequencing. Because we're not doing sequencing by synthesis, we become read length agnostic. We can read very long molecules. In fact, our customers brag about this. It becomes uh, a little bit of a bragging rights as to who can sequence the longest molecule. And currently the longest molecule that's been read, which has to be aligned to prove that it's been read, is a little bit over four megabases. Now that's the teal are the ends of the, the spectrum, but on average, people who are looking for long molecules are able to get molecules that are greater than 100,000 bases, and oftentimes are getting more and more molecules that are greater than a megabase. So it's really showing that the platform is able to see things in the genome because of the long molecules, and we'll talk about that throughout my presentation. Another thing that you'll notice from this slide, and I apologize, I'm going a little bit long here, is that we can do what's called real-time analysis. We call this adaptive sampling. And what this does is it allows us to be able to read a DNA molecule that's a single molecule as it passes through the nanopore. And we can actually take action as we're passing that molecule through the nanopore. We can do very interesting things like selection of the molecules we want to read versus the molecules we don't want to read. Or we can reject molecules um, because we want to do a complexity reduction. So that if we're trying to identify a particular pathogen in a sample, and we want to get rid of the host, we can reject host sequences while only allowing molecules that are specific to that particular pathogen. This allows us to increase sensitivity um, and be able to get uh, more information from the sample that we're looking at. So what I'm trying to set up here with the first slide, and the reason I took so much time to go through it, is to really start to help give the foundation for why Oxford nanopore sequencing is providing very information-rich information about the samples you're sequencing. We're able to detect many different types of information from the samples that we're sequencing, which include concepts like SNP detection, um, structural variations, um, but we can also detect, as I mentioned, methylation. We can detect large um, uh, aspects of phasing and allowing us to get different levels of assembly with our uh, data sets. And these are all being able to, are able to be done from the same data set that we're um, uh, sequencing uh, simultaneously within our um, experiments. Now, many of you look at Oxford Nanopore and think of us as the long read sequencing platform. And while that is a very true statement, it is actually not quite accurate in terms of the way we do our sequencing. We can do long reads. The record, as I mentioned, is greater than four megabases, which is really what I call an ultra long read. But we're also able to sequence any fragment of any length, and there's no bias in the sequencing. Sure, sequencing of short molecules happen faster, but there is no difference between choosing a short molecule from a long molecule in the way we do our sequencing, which means we're able to maintain the fragment length of your sample with regard to the read length of the sample that we're sequencing. And we've actually been able to open up our platform to be able to sequence from bases, uh, molecules that are 20 bases in length to molecules that are whatever length that you can produce within your sample. And this gives you a lot of flexibility. You can certainly size select, and many of our customers do that, especially if they're interested in a particular modality of the size of the sequences that they want to read, but you don't have to do that. You can certainly take whatever sample you have, the breadth of sample of um, uh, reads that are found within, sorry, the breadth of molecules that are in your sample and get the accurate read lengths of all those molecules that are found within your system. 
And because of this, we get many different benefits. One, we have very simple workflows. It's very easy to take a sample, um, extract it, do the library preparation, and be able to then put it onto our, our systems for sequencing. Um, some of our library preparations can take as little as 10 to 15 minutes, but the typical library preparation protocols take between an hour, hour and a half, depending on user's competency. As I mentioned, we're able to do real-time sequencing, and I'm going to show you some very distinct and interesting applications where we've applied that, where our customers have applied that, um, in terms of the different biological um, paradigms that they're interested in doing. Um, we have a very broad uh, uh, platform that will scale to the number of samples that you want to do. And I'm going to talk differently than you might have heard about this in the past because I'm talking to an audience of core lab um, uh, uh, managers and I want you to be able to understand how we present different devices and how they fit depending on your capacities and how you can move into different levels of throughput depending on your needs. Um, it's very accessible. Um, when we talk about acquiring our devices, we have what's called a starter pack model. So you're not really paying for the devices, you're paying for a starter pack, which gives you a device, all the software you need to run that device, but then you get a consumable set that allows you to start using the device and generating data. So you're not really spending your money on a device or the next generation or the next version of the device. Um, you're spending your money on consumables to allow you to generate data. And then we will talk about accuracy. I think it's um, inappropriate for me to talk to you without talking about accuracy. But we'll talk about accuracy sort of generally in terms of where we are and why we were focusing now, not only on our accuracy, but the things that people are using our data sets for, because they want to really not have a platform that's entirely accurate, but we want to make sure that we're getting the right biological truths from the samples that we're having. So what's at the heart of our technology? And for me, you know, it's clearly the nanopore. I mean, that's the chemistry that allows us to be able to sequence the different molecules that we're interested in looking at, whether it be DNA or RNA. But it really gets down to the flow cell. The flow cell is the consumable that you buy from us that allows you to be able to start running and doing the sequencing reactions. So there are different types of flow cells. We have what's called the flongal, the minion, and the promethion flow cells. And each one of them has different scales in terms of the amount of data that they're able to generate. The plongal generates with about 126 nanopores, um, the ability to generate between one and two gigabases of data. The minion flow cell is a higher throughput device, uh, a high throughput consumable, and it's able to use its 512 channels to be able to look at um, more DNA molecules. And as a result, it has a higher output. Um, and typically, depending on the experiment and the customer that's generating those libraries, we're seeing between uh, uh, 15 and 25 gigabases of data that are generated with the minion flow cells. Some customers get more, some customers get less. It really depends on the application. And for our high throughput customers that are interested in more complex eukaryotic uh, genomes, we have the Promethean flow cell. It has significantly more uh, nanopores that are able to be sequenced simultaneously. So it has 3000 uh, channels or nanopores. And as a result, we're seeing anywhere between 75 to upwards of 250 gigabases of data, again, depending on the samples and the type of library preparation that's being done by our customers. But each one of these consumables can be run on different devices. So I'm going to talk briefly about the upper uh, devices where we tap the MinION, the Mark 1C, and the GridION. Um, these run our Flongal and MinION type flow cells. And with that, we get different levels of capacity, as I've mentioned. Um, each one of these devices can be purchased in that starter pack model that I mentioned earlier, um, where there's no cost for the device, but you're paying for the consumables to get access to these devices. On the lower hand track, we have the different Prometheon devices. Um, I'm going to start from the right hand side to the left hand side because that's how they were introduced. Um, so the Prometheon 48 was our high throughput device that allows you to run 48 different Prometheon flow cells. Each one of these can be run independently. So you have the capacity to run 48 uh, flow cells simultaneously, or you can run any number of flow cells depending on what your capacity needs are. So you don't have to worry about batching in your um, uh, experimental design. You could run one flow cell, you can run 10 flow cells, you can run one flow cell this morning and run 10 flow cells this afternoon. Each one of those 48 positions is independently operated and the device comes with a new tower called the A100 tower which helps with the data processing um, for the base calling um, and the uh, instrument control. For those customers that don't think they need the capacity to run 48 flow cells um, at a time, we have what's called the Prometheon 24, which essentially has 24 positions. So it just gives you a slightly lower formatted uh, configuration, but the same Prometheon flow cell, um, the same uh, operating uh, system where you can run 
one sample or 24 or any inner uh, permutation in between. And then <clears throat> we just introduced what's called the Prometheon P2 line of uh, devices. This is really a lower throughput device. Um, again, same model of uh, starter pack, but now you can either run a Prometheon 2 solo, which attaches to the gridiron device for the compute and operation, um, and it runs two Prometheon flow cells. Um, this also has a, a starter pack configuration where you get some consumables, but you get the, the device um, free of charge. The Prometheon 2 is essentially a standalone device. For those of you who don't have a gridiron or a compute capability, um, this has the ability to run similar to the Mark 1C above, where it will run two Prometheon flow cells, but has all the compute and all the um, uh, components necessary to be able to run that without any other intervention of a computer or a monitor. So it gives you a lot of flexibilities with our devices. And as you look at this, you have the ability to grow into these devices so that if you don't think you have a lot of need in your capacity, in your uh, uh, core facility, you can start off with the Prometheon P2 solo. And as you build up your demand and you get more interest from your customer base, you can certainly build to the P24 or the P48. Because remember, there's no cost to being able to do that. You would just be paying for the consumables that you're um, uh, getting with this starter pack. So I wanted to talk about the Prometheon flow cell because it is a higher formatted flow cell. Um, and many of our customers are using this for larger experiments. And it also can be used with some of the experiments you might run on the Flongle or the Minion because we do have barcoding capabilities, which would allow you to run multiple samples simultaneously on the Prometheon flow cell, or you could run the Prometheon flow cell, wash it out and use it at a later date. So it becomes a very robust uh, consumable for different types of experiments. And I'm just showing you some of the attributes that people have been able to generate, generating between 100 and 200 gigabases of native genomic DNA, um, multiplexing, as I mentioned, up to 96 samples, and there are new kits that are coming out um, that will hopefully give us higher degrees of multiplexing capability. Um, to be able to get 200 gigabases of a metagenome, um, to be able to get different um, uh, understandings of that metagenome and the different components, um, as well as looking at different types of isoform analysis with single cell where we're getting over 100 million reads to be able to understand different complexities of isoform. And some of the work that I'll share at the very end of my presentation, we'll talk about single cell analysis, where people are looking at thousands of cells simultaneously and looking at the expression profiles um, of each of those cells. And being able to generate so many reads allows you to get the sensitivity for each of those different cell populations to be understand their transcript profiling. And all of this allows you to get um, uh, methylation uh, detection um, to really allow you to start looking at different aspects of the data beyond sequencing of the native canonical bases. So the Prometheon device is just becoming available. Um, I just wanted to show this to you because um, uh, a lot of people have been very interested in this. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with many core labs where they get a little bit hesitant because they're not ready to commit to a large number of samples. And the Prometheon P2 allows you to be able to get very quickly into running Prometheon style flow cells. Um, it's a $10,000 uh, starter pack, $10,000 and $450. Um, but it gives you the device, it gives you eight consumables, eight Prometheon flow cells, which allows you to start getting into running this type of scale of um, experiments for your customers to be able to explore higher level uh, eukaryotic genomes. And I just wanted to present this to you because, you know, I used to run a core facility a long, long time ago. Um, so understanding how I grow my core and how I support that is very, very important. So here we show the different um, devices, the P2 series, the Prometheon P24 and the P48 on the right. And what I wanted to just show you is that, you know, for each of these different starter packs, if you back out the other reagents that are included, um, you can see that the cost per flow cell starts to go down. Um, as you go from one device to the next. So we're not trying to overcharge in terms of the cost of the overall flow cells, um, but we're giving them at a reasonable cost that you can generally get into sequencing these types of capacity experiments and slowly build into the larger devices if you wanted to grow your business, if you're starting to see that need. So I think this is a really nice attribute of our platform. You don't have to make a commitment to a P48. You can start with the P2 and slowly migrate to the P24. If you have business where people are interested in running large projects and you have uh, enough to, samples to process on the 192 flow cells that are offered on the P24, you can start there. It gives you that flexibility as you start to grow your um, core lab business and the different types of projects that you're processing. 
So I want to talk a little bit about accuracy. Um, and I don't want to dwell on it because I think oftentimes we get hung up on what is the accuracy. And the reality is, is that no platform out there is at 100%. Everybody's getting closer to it, but no one platform is at 100%. But I think that what I want to be able to take away from this slide is that for those who have been using our platform for quite some time, this is a far improvement over what we've seen when we first produced um, and uh, delivered our platform to the community. And what this shows is that there's significant improvements that we've made in our chemistry, um, in our devices, um, in our algorithms that have allowed us to get to the level of performance that I'm showing here. And we certainly expect that we'll continue to make these types of improvements. So really the take home here for this is that we're doing quite well with regard to our accuracy. And many people are using the current platform as it stands today to get a lot of interesting biological understandings of the experiments that they're running um, with our platform. That being said, there's a continual process in uh, Oxford Nanopore to make our platform better. Um, so we look at many different aspects of our platform for them, the preparation. So we have these new uh, v, uh, KIP14 uh, kits that are out and available to give us higher accuracy with the newer uh, motor protein, uh, sorry, newer Nanopore. Um, we're looking at different uh, ways that we can do sequencing um, with regard to the data analysis and also some of the downstream analysis as well. So we're talking about raw data analysis with our base calling and different levels of consensus accuracy that we can achieve with some of the downstream um, meta-analysis um, software packages. And I just wanted to show you some of the data. Um, this is looking at uh, some of the new Q20 platform updates. Um, so you can see that this is looking at um, some sample sequencing at 400 base pairs per second using our KIP14. And you can see that with our SNP, indels, and SVs, we're starting to get very nice data sets. Um, again, not perfect. Um, but certainly getting up to the point where we're starting to see really nice uh, coverage um, and uh, accuracy with regard to the different types of um, uh, error models that people are interested in looking at. And building on this, so this is looking at the raw data, we can also look at the consensus accuracy. So this is looking at some both bacterial and human. Um, so the bacterial is um, certainly slightly stronger, um, which we typically see. Um, but you can see that with nominal coverage, you know, let's say 20x, we're starting to see Q50 accuracy on some of the controls that have been processed here. And as you start to look at the uh, human sample, this is being analyzed um, uh, with uh, Fly and Madaka, um, you can start to see that we're starting to get over um, Q35, um, but really starting to get, you know, Q45 to Q50 accuracy um, with coverage of, of between 30 and 40x. Um, uh, in terms of the overall um, accuracy. So it's just showing that we are starting to see really nice performance with the platform. Um, and we think that people are starting to use this in some of their experiments to really start leveraging the other advantages of our platform where we can start leveraging the output of our uh, higher devices like the P24 and P48 um, and the simpler workflows and lower cost per sample. So I like to show this slide. Um, because there's a lot of work that's being done by our customers. So the things you're looking at on this slide are the types of research that people are using with our platform. And we're certainly very proud of this because this is the work that our customers are doing. So I often tell people, you know, find your specific application to make sure that we're doing things or our customers are doing things that you're interested in. But also look left and right, up and down to see the different types of experiments, the different applications that people are currently doing um, because this is what people are using our platform um, in their different areas of research. And what I'd like to do as we go on to uh, the, the latter part of my presentation is to really talk about some of the things that people are using our platform for and how they're leveraging different attributes of our platform to ask different types of questions of the data. And I'll start generally. Um, so what I'm trying to show here is that you know, everybody wants to see as much of the human genome as possible, but there are different nuances of each platform that's out there that allow you to see certain things, but also not able to enable you to see everything. So we know that there are certain regions of the genome that short reads are just not able to access. About 8% of the human genome, um, based on different publications, um, clearly show that there are certain regions of the genome that are just inaccessible to a short read platform. And not surprisingly, I'm going to show you here that with long reads, it gives us better coverage to be able to see these particular regions of the genome, um, which allows us to get better coverage. Um, and this is really one of the big advantages of a long read platform is that we're able to start seeing things. We're able to start resolving regions of the genome that are very complex, that are often very challenging for a short read platform. 
And we'll talk about structural variants, repetitive regions, um, because these are some of the things that people are using with our data sets, uh, with the data sets that they're generating with our platform to be able to better understand some of the complexities that they miss with the short read platform. So we've talked about these different attributes, but what I'm gonna do in the next couple of slides is show how people are blending these together. Um, so the advantages of people are using our platform are really to look at ultra long uh, uh, to short read sequencing, to be able to look at structural variants, uh, to look at circulating free DNA, um, to be able to look at uh, single molecules, to be able to interrogate both DNA and RNA, to be able to see methylation patterns in the data and to be able to use the real-time analysis that we talked about to really target the regions that people are interested in to avoid having to do different types of uh, targeting uh, assays to be able to really um, uh, tune the different regions of the genome that they're able to interrogate. But they're not doing these in isolation with one another. They're doing these now together because our platform enables you to start looking at structural variants and methylation or targeting and methylation and seeing structural variants within those data sets that they're seeing because we start to be able to present that data to our customers and it allows them to get better depth in terms of the overall knowledge that they gain from their um, experiments and we call this a multi-omic approach so this is just one example for structural variants and the value of structural variants so this is a uh, paper that came out a while back um, i like showing this because this is a population-based study that was done by DECODE. Um, this uh, was an initial study of about 1,800 samples. They did a follow-up study where they've done now 3,600 samples, but they were looking at structural variants globally across the populations that they were sequencing. And you can see that the structural variants um, that they were um, identifying were certainly greater than what would have been found with a short read platform, but they were starting to see structural variants um, in the numbers of 22,000 um, which is certainly, you know, between 10 and three times more than what they would have expected on the short read platform. Uh, the total length of uh, the uh, region spanned by these structural variants range from 10 megabases um, with a read N50 of about 19. And they saw uh, 19,000 base pairs, um, but they were starting to see very interesting uh, 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 genetic components of these structural variants that were correlated to the different types of things they were seeing within the population in Iceland. But this wasn't just focused on uh, population-based studies. Um, many of our customers are looking at structural variants and large structural variants to be able to start explaining very small specific things within their data sets. So this is just a quick example showing where structural variants, um, looking at a large-scale structural variant, helped to resolve um, a potential false positive that was seen within the data. So this was a particular um, study that was looking at uh, structural variant susceptibility um, with our long reads um, within a particular cancer model. So they were looking at a, uh, a sample where they were looking at uh, uh, something called tuberous sclerosis complex. And within the short read platform, they had three cases that they couldn't quite resolve because the phenotype um, was showing that they did not have tuberous sclerosis, but the genotype that they were seeing indicated that they were. And this was because of the short read approach that they were doing. And it wasn't until they applied long reads where they were really able to see a broader picture of the cassette that they were looking at to be able to see that the inversion that they were seeing was within the intronic region. And it really wasn't an issue where these particular patients had tuberous sclerosis complex. And it's allowed them to reveal that these were actually benign cases and that this was actually a false positive that was generated by the short read platform. So they got better visibility as to what was going on biologically, and this allowed them to have better understanding of what was going on within these particular samples. We talked a lot about uh, methylation. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about it here. This is some work that was done internally, um, but one of the benefits of our approach uh, to methylation detection is that you don't need to do a bisulfite conversion. One of the downstream uh, or the detriments of uh, bisulfite conversion is you lose the complexity of the genome because you're converting uh, uh, the base to a uracil, um, which allows you to reduce the complexity of the genome. And that certainly has an impact with regard to the read depth uniformity that you see between a bisulfite conversion genome versus an oxford nanopore uh, methylation uh, determination genome. And the reason for that is because you need fewer reads to be able to map those bisulfite regions. Sorry, you need fewer reads to map a ONT methylated um, uh, read to the genome than you would with a bisulfite conversion because of that reduced complexity. 
And that's seen in the middle uh, column here under mapping rate, where you can see that there's more reads that are required to be able to see the same level of uh, methylation. And we're starting to see that as a result of that, there's lower analysis time that's required um, to be able to do that different types of methylation patterns. And we're seeing much better results um, with the ONT-based approach. So how are people starting to utilize this? So this is a paper that came out of Han Lee's lab at Stanford by Billy Lau. Um, and they're essentially looking at the ability to look at epigenetic characterization of cell-free DNA, or so essentially looking at liquid biopsy. Now, this is a very challenging uh, mechanism because the number of uh, molecules that are available in circulating free uh, DNA is very, very low. So there's a lot of optimization that the team did here um, to be able to improve the assay, to be able to look at small starting amounts of material and be able to start looking at epigenetic changes. And they were able to generate from less than, you know, a couple nanograms of uh, input material to generating over 6 million reads that they were able to use for epigenetic determination of the, the circulating free DNA in their samples. And this was really important because they weren't doing an amplification step. They weren't converting the uh, uh, circulating free DNA with a bisulfite conversion, which would have lost some of that methylation when they, were, when they were sequencing it. So by doing this, they were able to come up with a protocol that gave them very high sensitivity and the ability to monitor um, circulating uh, free DNA methylation patterns within their data sets. And they were able to correlate this using look, uh, some studies that they did with colorectal cancer samples, um, where they looked at the, um, the uh, circulating free DNA burden in the terms of the number of reads, um, and then correlating that with methylation patterns that they could then compare back to colorectal cancer samples and uh, uh, primary tumor that they were looking at. And what you can see here in this particular plot in blue on the bottom, the cumulative draw date is essentially a longitudinal study that they did with a particular patient. And you can see uh, that they were basically doing draws over the course of a 600-day period. And right around day 400, you can start to see that there's a dramatic increase in the uh, met metastatic progression of the sample that was identified using uh, imaging that correlated with methylation status change that was um, correlated with the primary tumor. So they're able to monitor over time circulating free DNA, see that there was low methylation patterns for the first 400 days. And unfortunately for this particular patient, the uh, cancer started to um, come back and they were starting to see a higher degree of methylation patterns within the circulating free DNA, um, which correlated with that primary tumor. So they were able to identify when the met, uh, cancer started to come back for this particular patient. And it's a really exciting study because they were able to get the sensitivity um, for this particular type of sample type, which is very challenging um, for you to be able to see um, in other studies. And it's very easy to be able to do this. Um, so uh, within <clears throat> our software, we've incorporated uh, what we call Remora into the Minnow software. So our methylation base calling is now built into our uh, software that's used to control the device and do the base calling. Um, and it's a very simple button click to be able to enable this type of methylation study um, and analysis. And the output that comes from the system is easily brought into different visualization tools um, to allow you to start seeing these different methylation patterns within these different software analysis tools that are available. So I want to start talking now about how people are combining these together. So we've talked about structural variants with the DECODE project and looking at tuberous sclerosis. Uh, we've talked about different ways of looking at methylation, but how do we start to bring this all together? How do you get more information from just sequencing and being able to see all these different facets of the data? So this is a paper that was um, uh, published this year by um, Dr. Sakamoto and his team. And they're starting to look at, <clears throat> excuse me, um, phasing of SNPs that they were seeing across different regions of the genome. Um, so this is a 1.5 kb region. They were starting to look at different mutations that they saw, and they were starting to do different types of phasing and to, to the generation of different haplotypes that they were able to see within these data sets. When they started building these different uh, haplotypes and these um, uh, phased reads that they were able to generate, they were also now able to start correlating different things that they saw with the data as well. So within these different samples that they were looking at, they were looking at matched samples between normal and tumor samples. And by looking at both expression profiling and the uh, DNA sequencing, they were able to start to generate different haplotypes that they saw within these data sets. And within these haplotypes, they were able to see different expression profiles of one haplotype over another haplotype. 
And by doing more sequencing of this, they were able to say, because we're able to identify these different haplotypes and because we're able to also simultaneously see expression profile, uh, sorry, um, methylation patterns within the data, they were able to start to see that certain haplotypes that had higher expression had different hypomethylation statuses than the other haplotypes. So they're able to start correlating more information to help them better understand some of the phenotypes that they were seeing um, in the genotypes uh, within the data sets. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about targeted panels, because a lot of customers are interested in not sequencing whole genomes, but specific regions of genomes that are of interest to them. This is a study that was done by uh, uh, Tim Gilpatrick out of Winston Tim's lab at Johns Hopkins University. And what he was interested in looking at here was um, specific regions of the BRCA1 uh, uh, gene. And he was looking at an 18 KB region. And what you can see on the right-hand side in purple is how he's able to use a Cas9 approach to allow him to target that 18 KB region um, and be able to selectively pull that out from different samples that he was looking at. Now, these were different types of breast cell breast cancer cell lines. Um, so he knew that there were specific things that were in these cell lines that he wanted to be able to see. But what he hasn't been able to see up until this point was that he wasn't able to see when he did his targeting with other platforms and other strategies of targeting, the different types of methylation patterns that were found within those data sets. But because he used a Cas9 approach, because that Cas9 didn't require uh, uh, a, um, a PCR uh, amplification step, he was now able to retain those methylation patterns and was able to start seeing different methylation patterns between the different alleles that he was finding within those data sets. And as a result, it gave him more insight into the different regions that he was targeting because he was using a targeting free approach from uh, amplification and allowed him to see those methylation patterns. Another approach to this for targeting regions of the genome is to use this process that we call adaptive sampling. We talked about this at the very beginning of my presentation. And really what we're doing here is we're using bioinformatics to be able to identify molecules that are sequencing in real time and ask the question, is this a molecule I want to sequence or is it a molecule that I'm not interested in sequencing? And the way we do that is we use what's called a bed file to be able to set a reference that we can align reads as they are sequenced in real time. And we can use the system to be able to align those reads as they're being sequenced and ask the question, does it align to my reference file or does it not? And if it aligns, continue sequencing it. As you see on the bottom uh, right-hand side of my slide here in yellow, this is a molecule that matches the bed file and we're gonna continue sequencing it in its entirety. But above it in blue, you can see there's a molecule that's being rejected. And when it's being rejected, it's because that molecule, as it's going through the nanopore, we're able to generate data and align it to that reference. And since it doesn't align, we're able to say, this is not a molecule I'm interested in sequencing and allow you to then reject that molecule so that you don't actually spend time sequencing it. So this allows you to have a bioinformatic capability to be able to decide, I wanna sequence these molecules, but I don't wanna sequence these molecules. And it gives you a lot of power in your data analysis because one, you're able to retain any sort of uh, methylation patterns that are found within your data sets, but you're able to start changing the things that you might want to be targeting. So like, let's say for instance, you have a set bed file of these are the targets that I'm interested in, but as you start to continue your project, you realize there might be things that you wanna drop off that you uh, no longer want to uh, monitor or there are molecules or regions of the genome that you want to include that you didn't have before. Instead of having to redo a targeted approach assay, generating more primers, more uh, uh, PCR amplicons, you can essentially just change the bed file and just run the experiment again. And now you're able to really change on the fly the different regions that you want or don't want to sequence within your experiment. So this is just some examples to show you the real power we have with our ability to do targeted selection with um, uh, this adaptive approach. So what you're looking at on the right-hand side here are two genes. So the first gene is purple, the second gene is in red. And what we did for the first 20 hours of this experiment is we decided to sequence the purple gene and not the red gene on the left-hand side, so the flow cell uh, side left. And over the first 20 hours, you can see the accumulation of reads for the purple gene and a very slow increase in reads of the red gene, which shows that we're uh, targeting one gene over the other. And at the 20-hour mark, we switched the, the decision. 
we said now no longer sequence the purple gene and continue sequencing the red gene. And you can see how we're able to now see a uh, reduction in uh, reads to the purple gene uh, from 20 hours on. But now we start to see a precipitous rise in the red gene as we go from 20 hours um, and beyond. But what we did in this experiment is we took the flow cell and we divided it in half. So we have a left side of the flow cell and a right side of the flow cell. And we did the converse experiment on each side. So for the first 20 hours on the left side, we amplified the, we targeted the purple gene. But on the right side, we targeted the red gene for the first 20 hours. So you see the converse uh, targeting between the times that we were doing different uh, sequencing. So the first 20 hours, the left side targeted the red purple gene, and the first 20 hours on the right side, we targeted the red gene, and then we switched the experiment. So it shows you the exquisite control that we have because we can control each individual uh, nanopore on the system to targeting the things that we're interested in targeting. And what you're seeing here is an experiment where we're just doing whole genome sequencing, but we're targeting the regions of the MHC on chromosome six. And what you're seeing are two experiments run in parallel. Uh, the control in purple and the red is the adaptive sampling, where we're allowing the red uh, experiment to target only genes, sorry, only reads that target to the uh, MHC locus. Whereas on the uh, purple uh, control, we're just doing a standard sequencing where all the reads are going through for the entire genome. And you see that there's a very clear amplification or targeting of just the reads to the MHC locus that we're interested in. So how are customers using this? Um, so this is a paper that was written by Danny Miller. Um, Danny um, is uh, uh, looking at adaptive sampling for specific regions of the genome that he's interested in sequencing. So what he's doing here is he's doing a research study to say, I'm interested in looking at particular patients that phenotypically are presenting with a particular phenotype. And as a result, I am making a hypothetical conclusion that we're seeing certain uh, regions of the genome that are affected based on that phenotype that I'm seeing. But I don't have any genotypic data to support that. So he used adaptive sampling to say, okay, I think these are the regions that are of interest, that there might be some variants, and I want to go forward and I want to sequence just those regions of the genome. So he ran, ran a shotgun sequencing on 40 individuals. Um, he targeted about 150 megabases, and he saw a 20x average coverage or a 500% increase over target region over the background. And by doing this, he was able to identify different types of uh, pathogenic variants um, that were not uh, uh, previously unresolved. Um, and he was able to identify different levels of structural variants um, that he was able to uh, resolve um, with this as well. So they did this as a comparison to work with um, a short read platform versus our long read platform approach. And there were no, no variants that were found with the short read platform that were missed with the long read platform. However, there were certain events that were missed by the short read platform that he was able to identify with the long read platform, presumably because of the long read nature. Um, so it really is a nice effective study that shows how you can take shotgun sequencing and targeting the regions that you're interested in and being able to very cost effectively see these. And I didn't mention this, but he did use methylation with this as well to be able to resolve different types of phenotypic um, attributes that he thought were potentially related to methylation and was able to corroborate those uh, observations in the data. So the final thing I want to talk about, and I'm hoping I'm not too far over time, um, is I want to talk about single cell sequencing with nanopores. Um, so I think many of you are familiar with um, single cell transcripts um, and being able to see different things in the data on a single cell level that you don't see with a standard bulk sequencing uh, transcript profiling. Um, and one of the things that differentiates our platform from other platforms is our ability to be able to get generate large numbers of reads, which will allow you to see many different types of cells and get the transcript profile for each of those individual cells. But more importantly, because we are a long read platform, we're able to start looking at different isoforms and discover different types of isoforms that are found within your samples. So it allows you to start looking at alternative splicing um, in cancer and neuroscience development, but also being able to see different types of things with regard to um, correlating CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene edits to different types of alternative splicing, which um, I believe I have an example in my data and my slides, I just can't remember. Um, and then we'll talk about some uh, work that was done looking at spatial isoform expression that you can start to see. Um, but the take home here is that with the number of reads that we're able to generate, with the long reads that we're able to um, produce, we're able to start seeing transcript profiles for single cells and be able to see different diversity in the data sets because of the single cell 
uh, isoform detection that we're able to generate with our data sets. So we're meeting these demands for these single cell experiments. What you're looking at uh, on the right-hand side is a typical T-SNE plot. Um, T-SNE uh, plot is essentially looking at the different cells that are being uh, investigated um, and looking at the different expression profiles that are found within those cells and how they um, are able to be um, uh, correlated with one another and seeing different patterns in the data as a result of those correlations. The power of these experiments is that you want to do as many cells as possible and have enough reads to be able to see the complexity of the different changes that are going on within each of these different cells and the different correlations that can be generated. As I mentioned, some of the early work that we saw with this, we were seeing 80 plus million cell assigned reads. Um, and some of the uh, uh, newer work that's being generated, we're seeing over 100 million reads with these uh, experiments. So I'm going to just open this all up so you can see all three columns. But um, we're really pleased that we have a full workflow that we can now um, offer to our customers with recommended protocols. Um, some of this stuff is uh, being done using the 10x single cell preparation. Um, the only difference in this protocol is that there's no fragmentation that's being done because we want to be able to maintain the, the complexity um, of these samples and the different isoforms that are in there. So it's the same 10x protocol that you might be familiar with. It's just it's omitting that fragmentation step. Um, we then are able to take those um, uh, inputs from the uh, are the cDNAs that are generated by the 10x uh, cell library prep and bring that into our library preparation where we can use our uh, PCS 111 kit and we're able to generate over 80 million cell assigned reads um, and then can be run on either the P2, the P24, or the P48. Um, and we have our data analysis pipeline <clears throat> generated by the um, scientists at Oxford Nanopore called Sockeye. It gives you a standard gene count matrix, um, tag, BAM, and UMAP, UMAP plots. Um, but we're also starting to uh, make some changes to that uh, data analysis pipeline um, to be able to introduce isoform count matrices, consensus uh, uh, for UMI, and different step infusion detections that you can start to use um, with those software packages. It's not out yet, um, but we hope to have that out quite soon. So what are some of the advantages that you can get with long reads and the number of reads that we're getting? So this is just a very simple example. You're looking at a clustering of different types of cells um, that are found within a particular sample. Um, and we're able to identify two different um, uh, clusters, an orange cluster and a, a blue cluster on the left-hand side. Um, this is what was generated by a short read um, platform um, to be able to identify these different clusters of different transcripts, or, sorry, different isoforms, uh, sorry, different transcripts. And then on the right-hand side, what you're looking at is you're looking at within those clusters, so the same clusters are given, given the same color. So the orange cluster two, um, on the left-hand side is uh, cluster two on the right-hand side, but now you're seeing cluster 2.1 and cluster 2.2, which is showing you that with the long reads, we're able to identify um, different isoforms that are found within those particular clusters. Um, and the same is true for the cluster 10. Um, on the left-hand side, we see only one cluster, but on the uh, right-hand side, because of the long reads, we see cluster 10.1 and 10.2, representing the different isoforms that were uh, identified um, within those subclusters. And what I'm showing you below is just for cluster two. So it's a little confusing because cluster two is orange and the reads are highlighted in blue. So it's not cluster 10, but it's cluster two. Um, but what you're seeing on the left-hand side are the short reads biased to the um, one end of the uh, transcripts and you're not able to see the complexity of the different isoforms. Whereas on the right-hand side, because of the long reads, you're able to start seeing the different isoforms. It's highlighted by the red triangle where we're starting to be able to see the different uh, transcripts are, and their isoforms that are found within the data sets that we're able to see with these long reads. So this is another example. Um, this was a, a, a study that was done by Lebregon um, in 2020, and they looked at 76 genes to be able to look and identify um, isoform switching that they saw in cell development. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, there were 76 genes that fell into this particular model. I'm only showing you one of the transcripts above. Um, so you can see in this gene CLTA, um, there's two trans or two isoforms, 204 and 206. And in cell development, they were able to show um, for this particular um, uh, isoform that there were two different states, the precursor and the mature. So the CLTA 204 isoform was more uh, found to be expressed in the mature cells than the precursor cells. 
And the switch was occurring with the CLTA-206, where they saw higher expression in the precursor cells than they did with the mature cells. This is something that would have been missed with a short read platform, but because we were able to look at the different isoforms, we were able to see this type of complexity um, within the data that would have been missed otherwise. We can also look at um, CRISPR edit changes. So what we're looking at here now is a sample that we do CRISPR editing with um, to introduce random changes in the uh, transcripts. And we're able to now look at those different changes. And because we're looking at the full length transcript, we can look at the full complexity of these different isoforms and their different expression levels. So what you're looking at on the right-hand side is you're looking at the expression of the different uh, regions of the different isoforms. And you can start to easily see of the different um, uh, uh, exons, which of the different exons are expressed and which ones are not, allow you to be able to then correlate um, the different uh, mutations that were introduced and how they're able to knock out the different um, uh, exons within these different isoforms. So this is an interesting um, uh, paper where they started to look at, uh, in a TSNE plot, the location and the cluster of the different expression uh, profiles for the single cells. But what they then did is they looked at somatic mutations that they were aware of based on the sequencing and to see if they correlated with the different clustering of the different expression profiles for the different single cell um, analyses that they did. So what you're looking at on the left-hand side is the typical TSNE plot um, with the uh, expression uh, correl correlation of the different uh, cell types. But then on the right-hand side, you're starting to look at mutations and seeing the pattern that's uh, being observed of the different mutations and how they correlate with the different expression of the different cells that are being identified. And you can start to see with the dark blue, the different clustering of mutations and how the clustering, um, if you look back and forth between the two different profiles, the different cell types that we're seeing um, within these or expression of the cells that are seen within these DCNE plots. So it really allows um, a different level of depth to be able to understand these data sets. Um, so we're seeing the different cell expression profiles, and now we're starting to see different mutational burden um, that's being seen within these different um, clusters. And then finally, <clears throat> this is looking at um, uh, uh, isoform expression in a spatial context. So here you're looking at um, the same uh, sample um, that you're looking at um, from the mouse brain. Um, and you're starting to now start looking at the different expression profiles um, and the different spatial changes that are occurring within that mouse brain of the different cell types. So you're looking at, um, uh, in the left-hand side, one isoform, SNAP25-201, and on the right-hand side, the SNAP25-202. Um, and you're seeing a very distinct difference in the uh, spatial resolution of the two different uh, isoforms um, that could be biologically relevant in terms of the understanding of this particular um, uh, sample. So I hope this was helpful in giving you sort of an understanding of what we were able to achieve with single cell in the many different contexts of the way customers are using this. Um, the platform provides the depth of uh, coverage in terms of the number of reads to be able to look at a large number of cells and the sensitivity to see the different changes in the terms of the isoforms that are um, detected. Um, there's a growing number of publications that are showing the added value of these long reads to look at isoforms and SNPs Splicing compared, splicing paired with somatic variants um, or, or CRISPR edits. Um, I didn't show you an example of gene fusion because I was worried about time, um, but there are examples where we're looking at gene fusions as well um, with the different isoforms um, that can be seen within these data sets and the long reads um, and different types of high resolution cell type clustering where you combine that with some of the somatic mutations that I've seen. Um, we do have an end-to-end -end workflow um, using uh, sequencing with full length 10X genomics uh, single cell cDNA and combining that with our workflows for the library prep with the PCS 111 and our Sockeye software to be able to analyze the data. Um, and I will stop there because <clears throat> I'm about to lose my voice. Um, I hope this was very useful. Um, uh, I think we have some time to answer some questions. Um, Catherine's on the line so that if there's a question that you stumped me with, um, she can hopefully back me up. Um, and with that, I will say thank you so much. Um, you've been a great audience so far. Um, and I look forward to the questions. If we don't get a chance to answer any of your questions, I will certainly um, make sure that we take a quick copy of them and uh, try to um, answer those questions and get them back out to you guys. Jim, I, I can help drive the questions for you to keep them in order. If we have a, a few flowing in, just keep them coming for everyone. But the first one we have from Sean Vargas is, does the size of the DNA or RNA affect the output? 
So it shouldn't. Um, so um, the sequencing rate is um, about 400 to 450 basis per second. With the KIT-14, that sequencing rate can change, um, but it's really the rate of sequencing that dictates it. Um, one of the things that um, can be a factor that is minimized, and I can go into details about why, is the time between one molecule going through the nanopore and the next molecule. So there could be a lag um, of that time when there's that uh, no molecule that has been engaged with that nanopore. That's reduced because we have something called, um, uh, well, we have something that basically draws down the molecules to the membrane surface so that the molecule, next molecule is in close proximity to the nanopore, which allows us to reduce that time between molecules. So there really shouldn't be any difference um, between the size of the DNA and the uh, output that you generate. Perfect. All right, so Stuart Levine has a question. Can you talk about how to handle lower input amounts? With Cas9, the inputs have to be very low, but with the protocols, we need micrograms um, of input, which are too high for many of our users. Any tips or tips are welcome. So I'm going to actually have to defer on this one because I'm not an expert on the Cas9 protocol. Um, if you don't know the answer, Kat, um, we can certainly get the answer um, for you, uh, Stuart. Um, I actually will be in Boston next week, so I'm happy to stop by and give you more information. So I do apologize. I am not an expert on the Cas9 protocol, um, and I'm not sure about um, optimizing it for the lower input amounts. Yeah, I, I would just add to that and say the, the input requirement for the Cas9 protocol is, is our highest, since it's around three to five micrograms. Yeah. Typically, if you're trying to just run ligation sequencing kit on our platform, you can actually fragment the reads or PCR amplify them. So that you could get away with lower input. The input amount is correlated to the fragment length that you're loading on the platform. So as an example, if you're loading something like cell-free DNA samples, now that we've enabled that, you could actually drop the input amount 25 nanograms. The challenge with Cas9 is you're really looking for a needle in a haystack because you aren't amplifying the material. So if you are interested in doing targeted panels um, to retain the methylation information, then at that point, we probably recommend considering adaptive sampling as an alternative, because at that point, you could at least explore something like our rapid sequencing kit, um, which has input of about 400 nanograms um, onto the flow cell and then do the enrichment um, while you're sequencing. Yeah, could, you, could, you kind, could you combine the uh, Cas9 with the adaptive? You could do Cas9 with adaptive, but the input is still going to be quite high. Oh, um, yes, agreed. Yeah. All right, good question, Stuart. So the other question we have from David Carlson, does adaptive sampling work for arbitrary species and reference genomes or only for humans? So yes, the, the, the adaptive sampling is not restricted to just human uh, genomes. You could use it for whatever you have knowledge of. Um, it's really just a matter, a matter of understanding what you want to target um, or what you don't want to target within your sample. So as long as you have that information, you can create that bed file to whatever organism you're interested in. Yeah, and I, I just went and checked. That's a good question because we actually have a, a catalog on our community that users upload bed reference files that they've used successfully with adaptive and C. elegans is on there as, as example. Um, John wants to know, will the slide deck be made available? I, I think Ken and Anoja are sure. recording this. Yes, right? we are, and we'll send that out to everyone tomorrow. All right, perfect. Thank you, Ken. Um, so uh, Sridhar, wants to know, can you use adaptive sampling for mixed samples and selectively sequence host and pathogen directly? Um, so is it, it, so I'll try, I, I can't ask the question because you're, you're, you're putting in here. So you can use it for mixed samples. Um, some customers have used uh, adaptive sampling to reduce host to get better sensitivity with pathogens um, that are found within the sample. Um, I wasn't sure if you were asking if you could then turn off and start sequencing host versus pathogen, um, but you do have those capabilities. You have complete control over what you sequence and what you do not sequence. Um, and there's many different ways that you could use the adaptive sampling. Okay. All right, Jenny says, excellent talk. Um, can you tell us a few key differences between Nanopore and SQL 2E systems? So um, look, I, I, I'm gonna talk about our platform. Um, I won't talk about other pl customers' platforms. Um, I think that the things that I look at as a as a as an employee at Oxford Nanopore, but if I were running for lab, you know, for me, I'm looking at a platform that's going to give me 
flexibility to do the things that I want to do um, and not be confined. And I think that Oxford Nanopore gives you that. Um, I think that the ability for the P24 and the P48 to give you the ability to run one sample or 24 or 48 samples certainly shows the ability for the output um, that we can generate with our system. I think our accuracy um, is slightly below some of the others, but I think it's pretty darn close from what I showed you today. Um, and I think that people are able to see biological relevance. And combining that with the output that people are able to generate, I think you now can run more biological replicates, which may be even more powerful than running one sample and comparing it to another. And I'll leave it at that. Well, James, so I, see, Catherine, I think I'm getting the hook. That's okay, but no, thank you both very much. A very informative presentation, tell, tell by the questions, lots of engagement. We truly appreciate your participation and contributions to our series. Uh, once again, a reminder that the series continues next week, same time. You'll see the link on the website. And as I mentioned earlier, everyone participating today or everyone registered today will also receive the recording of today's program probably in about 24 hours once it processes and, and we send that out. So once again, James, Catherine, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone who joined us online. And then hopefully we'll see many of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.